<laughs> Hi, I'm Joel Shoemaker. Uh, my wife Becky and I collaborate on our art here in this house, this studio. This is known as the Gibbs House because uh, Charlie Gibbs was a commercial fisherman that lived here for a long time, raised his family here, used to fish on the Mississippi River and sell his, his uh, fish at the uh, fish house that was managed by Gary Galima across the road. So when we were able to buy this house, we got a lot of that history with it. It was built in 1912. Lots of people that come to see us say they really like our little house. Actually, it's ceramics that brought Becky and I together. We uh, met were, in the pot shop. We met in the pot shop in Urbana, Illinois, when we were students at the University of Illinois in the spring of 71. Uh, Becky was an art education major and I was an art ed minor and we both happened to be taking ceramics in different classes with different teachers but the same semester. And one night we both showed up in the pot shop at night. What happened, Beck? You were there. <laughs> I, was, I brought a friend to show her how to throw. Of course, I couldn't throw on the potter's wheel and I struggled and just young guy sat down across from us and he had all these wonderful pots and he was just making pots and I, as I left with my friend I said I think I'm in love and she said you're in love and I said well that with that guy's hands he's just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we're still together now. We, we both entered uh, public school uh, teaching careers. Becky was an art ed or an art teacher in elementary school mostly and then I became a reading teacher and uh, be later became a school librarian. But we discussed as we were going through our professional careers that we'd always wanted to get back to art. Becky was doing a lot of art on the side and I was carrying the potter's wheel that I had bought from a friend in 1972 from place to place as we moved our family around to Iowa City uh, from Vinton and from Manchester. and. Um, Finally, we, we took a workshop together and said, let's see if we can collaborate. So I've been throwing pots and Becky helps decorate them and we'll show you more about that in other parts of the video. So I like to throw, as you can see, lots of thrown forms here, different sizes and shapes, and I hand them off to Becky and she does the surface decoration. In many cases, painting directly on the pot but with underglazes, then we use a spray gun and spray clear over the top and give it this nice shine protective finish. So she likes flowers as she mentioned when she was talking about her cards and other work. A couple pots like that that are very decorative. I'm going to hand those aside. She likes fish and, and uh, we spend part of our year in Florida so a bowl like this that's just decorated with lots of bright colors. My friend Laura down in Florida says this is Joel's Fiesta wear. We do use color a lot, so uh, some, some people don't. We like color. And then look how pastel this looks. Uh, nice brush treatment here on the outside, just doing some blending of the color. Really makes a beautiful decorative bowl. We've started experimenting with something new this year, which is using tape as a mask to uh, put tape uh, designs on the pots and then give it some sort of treatment, in this case with underglazes again, or glaze, different colors, uh, using the masking in different ways. So that's something new we're just starting to develop. I'm going to hand those aside. And then the thing we've been doing for years is called sgraffito, an uh, Italian word, certain kind of um, surface decoration these are examples that we have here. Most of our scrivito is down at MMCA at the left bank in McGregor right now. But this is an example where a thrown form is decorated with areas of black underglaze. Then Becky carves away the black after it's dried uh, while the pot is still green, while it's still soft enough to be carved. So you can feel the texture here of the carving that she's done to make these designs. And then um, applied color after the item is carved. So a bowl with scraffito on the outside, a little hand-built piece again, scraffito decoration, plants, flowers, bees, makes a very beautiful little pot. Normally when we have our studio tour this room is full of horizontal spaces that are full of pots, but right now I'm just using this set of shelves 
to store some of the things that I have here at the house. Most of my work that's for sale right now is down at the left bank in McGregor, what was called the Marquette McGregor Center for the Arts and MCA. And uh, so what I have here right now is stuff I've been working on just recently. And of course we're shooting this in August and the sale this fall will be in early October, so there's a lot of work to come out through the kilns in the next five or six weeks before we have the show. What I have here are some examples of some of the series I'm working on. I'd like to mention to you a couple things about them. So here, for example, you see two different kinds of bowls, two different shapes, and similar sizes, where Becky has taken the bowls that I've thrown and done surface decoration on them. Both of these have the same basic design, what she calls her village or houses design with buildings and trees. This one is painted directly with underglazes on the pot after it's come out of the uh, bisque firing in the kiln. This is one that was done with a different technique that we just started trying for the first time in the last couple months where she paints on paper, applies the paper to the surface and sort of uh, transfers the image like a decal. So you get an entirely different effect on those two pots even though the design is very similar. Since our retirement I've been being able to work on my pots. I've been developing my uh, different series of pots that I want to make in ceramics. Uh, I'm not a production potter. I don't make hundreds or thousands of the same shape or mug. I, I don't really have the skills for that at the time or the inclination. So what I do instead is work on series of objects that I get ideas about. So this was an idea called the walking vase. You see three examples here and I want to show you kind of the process that I go through to make a walking vase. I start doing my favorite part which is throwing a piece. In this case I threw a vase about this size and then I use a wire to split it, cut it down the middle, make it look like it's walking. Now, the base can be small, medium, or tall, and then I turn it over this way and do a slab-built piece on top, join it together with some kind of decoration, take care of the seams, and uh, when it sits on the table, the idea is it looks like it could be trying to walk off on its own. Clay is pretty static. Uh, I like to have the clay show that it's clay, that it's malleable moldable, that it moves, that it reacts to the human touch. So in the surface decoration, in the textures, in the shapes of the edges, I want the clay to look like clay. You know, my shop is pretty small and pretty simple. I started with my home-built table, which is fine for making slab-built pieces and working by hand. I have the wheel that I bought, how many years ago, 50 years ago, that I put a little table on, throw uh, you see the kiln that I bought secondhand. We've got some shelving to store the work as I create it. Uh, it's pretty simple, and uh, it doesn't take a lot to get started doing something at the level that I'm working at. We did invest a lot of money in this machine, a pug mill, so that I can uh, remix all of my clay when I use it. I get some slop in the bucket. I have some dry scraps like this from trimming pots. I can put it all in there and remix the clay and get back to work. So that's one of the things I like best about uh, having a pug mill is I uh, can much more quickly recycle everything. Nothing goes to waste in a pottery. Before I got the pug mill, I could recycle all my material, but I had to do it by hand over here with wedging and, and adding moisture and taking care of it. Now I put it in the pug mill, it does most of the work for me. When the pug mill is running, it can extrude the clay when it's ready to use out this nozzle on the end under this rubber cap. And, and it comes out looking like this, like a log that I can cut off into appropriately sized pieces. And I take the log, among other things, I could wedge this up into balls like these, or I can bring it over to my slab roller and create a slab which is used to make hand-built pieces. So in this case, we're just going to cut this in half, put it in place here, I'm going to meld those two pieces together just a little bit by hand. 
throw the canvas over the top. And feed that into the slab roller. come up with a pretty nice even slab that we can peel off the canvas and use in any number of ways. Cut this into different shapes, roll it as it dries, manipulate it in different ways, put different textures on it, and do all kinds of hand building using these slabs. You know, it's kind of funny because I like to think of myself as a thrower. I like to spend most of my time on the wheel, but because of that I'm trying to challenge myself and learn to do some different techniques. So that's partly why I'm doing the walking vases, so I can combine the wheel throwing for the base and the slab built upper part. There are a lot of texture rollers you can use. These are some we've purchased that are carved out of wood, and some of them are made of a rubber that goes onto a roller. You can get different designs, different patterns, create uh, a lot of textures. Uh, this is a little uh, bowl I've thrown off the hump to make one of my fish. I'm just going to cut it off with the wire, set that over here with the others I've made, and then we'll show you what we do with them to make them fish mouths. This is a fairly soft clay. I'm just going to pick it up like this and drop it, and there is the mouth for a fish. One is successful. Can we do two? Oh, wide one. <laughs> Very good. And then this little guy. So that's what we're going to start with. We'll carve details into it and add hand-built pieces and then do the painting and decorating to make those into fish. One of my customers who's bought a number of these calls them freaky deekies. So I don't, you know, sometimes they turn out more like tadpoles or frogs, but mostly they're fish. And they start as a thrown form. The uh, series picture that I sent in for use in this uh, fall studio tour goes through some of the steps in making these. You can see there are different sizes and shapes and different kinds of additions to a basic thrown form. But you can see we like color. So again, I'll, I might uh, make the thrown form. I'll pick some of these, like this one I happen to make and this one I made. Some of these Becky makes, so this is a Becky fish. And uh, again, we share in the painting, the coloring, uh, the basic design elements, uh, decision-making process as we go through, but each one becomes unique and different. You can throw candy in these. I like to have it as a place to throw my keys. Some people use them for business cards. When you get a big mouth like this, it might even work for a sponge beside the sink. So people find lots of different uses for these silly little fish, and we just kind of enjoy making them because they're all different and all unique. Uh, you know, we live here on Lansing on the Mississippi River. We're in what's called Pool 9. We're above the, the dam number 9. And uh, this map is on our kitchen wall. I look at it a lot when we're in here doing things in the kitchen. And it's my inspiration for the pieces I'll show you next. So I started making slab pieces that represent Pool 9. So dam to dam with the towns marked along the side and some other detail and texture included. Each one's unique, each one's a little different, uh, and, and it's a, another one of the series that I'm working on this year. I'm trying to reimagine the river in different configurations. I'm still working on the Pool 9 series, so these are one, two, three, four more pieces that I've created and bisque fired that have not yet been glazed. So again, these started with the slabs over there from the slab roller, and then I carved in and textured and decorated with color, and now I need to put a clear glaze on them and get them fired up to cone six. These pieces can be fired in different ways depending on what I put or don't put on top of this coloring. So. I can fire them just the way they are and the colors will come out about like they are, but it'll be harder and, and uh, cone six. I can put on a matte clear glaze that won't be shiny, or I can put on a glossy 
clear glaze that would put a shine on it like the pots I showed you inside. On the back side, I've put uh, little hangers so I can put a wire in there. These could hang on a wall, but I think they also work on a table. So another series I've been working on is what I call my shot pots. You know, one of the questions I was asking myself was, most of my pottery is utilitarian. It's just bowls and plates and platters. And what happens when a utilitarian object becomes useless? Uh, I, I had an idea back in 1971 of making a shot pot. It was, I was thinking about the moon shot. And, uh, you know, I just met Becky and, and we made a moon shot pot, which was a double entendre because I was thinking of the lunar lander on the moon and I was also thinking of Becky and had her sit in the pot and molded the pot around her bottom. And so it was kind of a moon shot. And I thought, well, what other kind of shot pots could there be? And I had a friend that had a 22 rifle. So I took some pots out to the edge of town and set them up along a ditch and shot the pots while they were still soft clay with this 22 rifle. So that's the idea that I'm revisiting here. I'm starting a new series of shot pots where I line these up when they're still wet and shot and shoot them and you can see what happens with the impact of the bullet both on the outside and inside of the pot. It's really quite amazing. I started these before our current summer of unrest concerning shootings and violence, you know, before it reached the boiling point that it has now. So I don't think of these necessarily as being a political kind of piece, but obviously art does reflect our times. And you can hardly look at this kind of thing now and not think about the destruction that happens to human bodies and uh, when shootings occur. Um, I'll, uh, I'm amazed at, at what happens uh, when the bullet impacts these surfaces and I, it helps me think about things like why do we do the things we do? Why do we take something that's utilitarian and useful like a bowl and make it so that it's not useful as a bowl but instead becomes art. So I want to thank you for taking this tour with me around my studio and seeing what kinds of work I'm doing at the moment. Um, hope we can see you virtually in early October. Uh, I'm not going to be shipping ceramics. I'm not going to ship the pots this fall. I'm hoping people who are interested can come here and pick it up. You could call us on the phone. You can email us. You can visit our websites and contact us any way you want. We're glad to have you stop by and we'll make a safe way for you to get the goods. Thank you very much.